<laughs> so hello, everyone. Um, happy to be here with you talking about um, the rusty patch bumblebee and some other bumblebees too. So um, the, the main focus is going to be on um, identification, but I wanted to include some other information too. So my name is Elaine Evans. I'm an extension educator and researcher at the University of Minnesota. And so um, before I mostly just start talking about bumblebees, I just wanted to um, give a brief little shout out to the diversity of pollinators out there. So there's um, a, a lot of different pollinators that we have here in Minnesota um, that are all kinds of different shapes and sizes and, and colors and um, really beautiful things to, to keep an eye out for as well. Part of the reason why I focus on bumblebees and why you may have heard more about bumblebees than, than a lot of the other bees is that um, they are um, one of actually most of those bees. We don't know a lot about their status for how they're doing for their populations, but bumblebees are a group of bees where we have more information about them. And unfortunately, we know they're not doing well. So um, across North America and the same pattern um, goes globally where, where the information has come in. It's about one out of every three bumblebee species that are um, in categories where we're concerned about their population. So they're threatened, near threatened, um, vulnerable, you know, endangered, not doing well, um, unfortunately. Some background on bumblebees. So they have an annual life cycle. And um, right now we've got um, queens that are just starting to come out. So they've spent the winter underground and they're gonna be coming out. Um, these queens are the only ones that have survived the winter. They mated the previous fall and they're able to just go and start new colonies. So these new queens will be coming out soon they need to find things to eat, and then they need to find places to start their nests. Those colonies will build up over the summer and eventually the workers, which are also female, and um, they'll be coming out and um, they'll start doing all the work while the queen stays inside the nest and the colonies will continue to grow. They'll eventually, hopefully, grow to the point where they can produce new queens and males so that, that they haven't reproduced at all really until they get to that point. So, this is part of why they need resources all through from spring through till fall. The that next generation will be produced. The, the new queens will, will mate, and they are the only ones that will dig themselves into the ground for, for hibernating and um, come out next year. For the rusty patch bumblebee, and um, so different bumblebee species have a little bit different time cycle. But um, pretty soon now, um, the, the queens for, for rusty patch bumblebees will be coming out. Some other earlier species are already coming out now. Um, I know I've, I have a few reportings from them around the Twin Cities, um, you know, not, not these last uh, week and a half or whenever it's been cold, but before that. And I imagine next week when it warms up, they'll really start coming out. But rusty patch bumblebee is a little bit later, uh, more in May. And um, eventually those, um, those workers start really being noticeable in, in July. And that's when new queens and males will also come out. So when you're looking for, for, um, for rusty patch bumblebees, July and August are really gonna be your best months to find them. Um, and then, um, but they'll be around through, through um, a chunk of September. And then, um, and then we won't see them over the winter. So rusty patch bumblebee used to be pretty common. So before the year 2000, so about 20 years ago, they were um, found pretty regularly across Eastern North America, um, you know, across the North and then down kind of through the, through the Appalachians in the, in the East. So um, they, they, a little bit in the, you know, kind of um, higher elevations or the higher latitude. But um, since then they, they're, really seriously declined. So across that range, um, kind of since then, um, they've really only been found in a handful of spots, those spots that are that are yellow, and really reduced numbers. So the numbers here are the total numbers that have been that were found um, and reported to the, the Fish and Wildlife Service, which we're 
trying to get all the sightings reported there. Um, so, you know, for an entire species, um, these numbers are, are still pretty low, even though um, you can see there's a nice kind of, um, we're filled in pretty well around the Twin Cities here where, where we're finding them in the Twin Cities and near the Twin Cities, but um, still at really low numbers compared to, to what it should be. And part of the reason um, that they're happening is this combination of, um, of a bunch of things happening um, that is um, these stressors that we're worried about keeping their populations down. So it's hard to know what was the cause of that initial decline, but we know that all of these things contribute to keeping their populations low. So these are things that we want to try to control. And that these arrows in between are indicating that there's relationships between these things where, um, where you know, pesticides can um, increase the susceptibility of these two pathogens. Um, so habitat loss is really at the center, but um, all these other things, pesticides, pathogens, parasites, climate change, um, impacts from, from managed bees, all can be stresses on the, the small populations that are left. And then that small population itself is a stress because um, there is a, a lack of genetic diversity that can happen when a population gets really small. So we're, um, we're definitely concerned about that with the rusty catch bumblebee where they had such a severe population decline. So before I get into the ID stuff, I wanna just talk a little bit about things you can do to, to help. So for combating habitat loss, there's a couple different things that you can do. One is um, thinking about nesting habitat for these bees. Um, and this is not rusty patch bumblebee here, but um, a lot of the bumblebees are pretty similar in their, in their nesting um, preferences. So these nests I mentioned are started each spring by these solitary queens. Um, the main thing is they like a cavity that has some kind of insulating material in it. So this can be an old mouse nest underground. It can be a, a bird nest above ground. Sometimes it can be um, a pile of grass that's um, dried and is kind of sheltered, even if it's above ground. Um, in, in human habitats, they're found, um, bumblebee nests are often found in um, compost piles and in the kind of insulation around air conditioner. The kind of the best way to make habitat for them is just having undisturbed corners, leaving some piles of, of sticks and leaves, leaving some corners where, where things are, are piled up so that you can create that kind of natural habitat for them to find and, and make their nests in. And a really exciting thing last year was, you know, the, for the first time in 20 years, we found rusty patch bumblebee nests. And one of them was in the Longfellow neighborhood. Another one was down in Red Wing. And um, these are some photos of just us at the nest doing some, some observations with them. So one nest was actually, um, my my son is is this is me standing here and then my my son is with me he's holding a net over the entrance which was just right into the foundation of this house and this nest was just um behind the foundation and between the foundation and some insulation the other nest was right next to someone's back steps and it was just under it was just in an old mouse nest that was um underneath some landscaping fabric right next to their back steps so um, rusty patch bumblebee, there is as some notes from the past that they, they, they were pretty commonly found nesting near people's houses. So um, it's good that they're so adaptable. So um, we're hoping that maybe we can find more nests this summer and, and learn some more. We're able to get a lot of really cool information from, from those nests. So um, the other big part of habitat that people probably already heard about is, is flowers. So um, planting flowers for pollinators, having a pollinator garden is, um, is really crucial. It makes a huge difference. So for rusty patch bumblebees, having something blooming from you know, April or May through September, um, a wide variety of flowers. So there's a lot of flowers in the mint families and, and pea family and aster family. There's lots of choices. They're pretty generalist and will visit a lot of different flowers. Um, bee balm is a really popular one for that um, July and August when the, the colony is, is really going. 
those early spring flowers are going to be really important to give those colonies a chance to get going though. So, so don't forget about early spring. Don't forget about trees in spring that are flowering. So things like willows and maples are really important pollen sources. And um, in general, we, we recommend having a group of plants together, a group of the same flower together could be more attractive to help bees find them. So the third piece of this habitat is something we don't actually know a lot about. So overwintering habitat, um, where those queens are going and hibernating all winter, we know that they um, are um, you know, finding some place. We know they're digging themselves down on the ground a couple inches. We don't ha have a lot of information about what if they have any real preferences. So the main thing there is also just going to be having some undis undisturbed habitat, some places that aren't being dug up that you can um, hopefully they'll they'll find it and and get in there. So um, in terms of helping bees, besides that habitat climate action, that the climate change is something we're really concerned about being a stressor for for the rusty patch and other bees. So supporting um, clean energy and environmental regulations, planting trees and grasslands. So um, a lot of native prairie plants get really deep roots and can do a really good job of sequestering carbon in, in addition to those trees, as well as um, you know, sustainable agriculture, supporting local environments, lots of different things we can do. And um, for those habitats, all those habitats, so not just the flowers, but also looking at the, the nesting habitat, and the overwintering habitat, keeping pesticides um, away as much as we can. So insecticides, fungicides, herbicides off of pollinator plants. When you're buying plants, making sure they haven't been previously exposed as, as much as you, that can be hard to do, but um, working with, with your, your, um, where you're getting plants from to um, make sure that they know what's been put on the plants because some of those chemicals can stay within the plant. For um, managed bees, so the honeybees and commercial bumblebees. So some people aren't aware, but there's also a commercial bumblebee industry. And there's concerns from, from all of these managed bees of um, there's concern about disease moving from them to other, other wild bees. So um, managing those bees to reduce disease, reduce exposure for other bees, as well as um, when managed bees are brought into an environment, making sure that there's not just enough to support them, but there's more than enough so that um, not only those managed bees, if there's honeybee colonies that are brought in, it's not just enough for them, there's enough flowers for everybody else too. And then this is where um, you come in again, besides your, your gardens is um, getting into the bumblebee ID, with um, public science efforts, with um, help from you to document rare bees and, um, and track bees. So I'm gonna move into um, getting into some information about um, how to ID and what we need to look for. And so, um, so Daniel had mentioned, you know, having three photos, it really helps to have a few different angles on the bee. So um, when you're taking photos to share, it helps to have a view of, of the top of the bee, their, the, um, the top of their abdomen, as well as the, their face, as much as from the kind of directly in the front as you can get, as well as the side. So for taking those photos, the macro setting and getting as close as you can can help. Um, the macro setting a lot of times is that little, little flower thing. But also um, videos can be a great way to get these different angles. Um, some, I know some of the, the phones now have incredible um, video capability where you can, can take videos and the stills captured from them are, are still really good quality. So some of these bees can be moving around pretty fast. If you're having trouble getting you know, these pictures from a different angle, sometimes just taking a video of them while they're on the flower moving around, you can go back later and get those still photos out from there. Um, there's those, tips and some other tips at the, the website I have here on Bumblebee Watch. They have um, some more tips for how to, how to get photos. One of the other tips is it does help to know a little bit about Bumblebee ID so that you can make sure that the photo that you're getting shows the character that somebody who's IDing it needs to see. So for the Rusty Patch Bumblebee, 
there are um, two key characters. And the first one is on the thorax. So right behind the head, the section with the wings there. On the thorax, um, it's mostly yellow, but then in the middle, there is this black T shape. And then um, combined with that, on the abdomen, on the second segment, there's where that's where this rusty patch is. And um, so the, the first segment is just, oops. Um, this segment here, this, this is the second segment that has the rusty patch. And you'll see that there's yellow on the other side of it. So before it goes to the rest of the abdomen being black, it's kind of yellow, the rusty patch, yellow again, and then all black. Um, and the, you'll be mostly seeing females through um, through July, but then starting in August, the males start coming out, and the males have a, a really similar color pattern. So, um, so you just need to look for those those same things. Um, so here are some some photos. That rusty patch can look different depending on how the light hits it. So, um, so yeah, when you're taking photos, just be aware of of the light. Um, and it helps to have light on it. So be aware of where your shadow is going as you're, as you're standing there. Um, but here are a couple of photos. And, um, and another one, so you, you can kind of see that that rusty patch is sometimes more subtle. Sometimes it's more kind of brown, sometimes it's more orange. And um, sometimes, you know, what you'll be looking at. So this is one that's, you know, inside of a, a little vial, um, which which you shouldn't be doing. Um, you have to have a, a permit for the Fish and Wildlife Service to handle them. Um, but um, but here it's this photo is actually enough to see. I can see enough of that little T on the thorax, and I can see, you know, shading happening here. But um, it can get kind of subtle. I wanted to go over a few species that look similar to the rusty patch that um, to, to help you pick, pick them apart from other bees that you are probably more likely to see. So one of those, one of that's um, pretty common is the brown belted bumblebee. So the key characters here um, are this swoop on the second abdominal segment. So you can see it does, this one also has this kind of rusty color, but it's in kind of just this swoop across the second abdominal segment. And if you look at it, that, that rusty um, orangish and brownish, it goes right up to black. So there's not yellow hairs on the other side of that segment. Um, the males, again, are pretty similar. The, the males for this species have really big eyes. So that's one thing um, if, you, if you notice a difference there. So here, I think I only have this one photo, but you can see the brown there is, is right up against the black on the following segments, whereas on the rusty patch, there's the brown and then there's the yellow again. One that um, a lot of people get excited about when they go up north is the tricolored bumblebee. Um, you're, there, there are a few of them that show up in the Twin Cities, but um, they are very common here but they're very common once you get up above, kind of halfway up the state and higher. Um, they're probably, um, they're one of the most common bumblebees up there. And these guys, they have that a similar kind of black T shape on the thorax, but it's a little bit more distinct. They do have some orange, but this is bright orange and it's the whole segment. So these guys on their second and third abdominal segments, it's bright orange. So they go yellow, bright orange, bright orange, yellow again, and then and then black. Um, the males again are similar. They have um, a, a bit more yellow hair on the face. And um, these guys are pretty brilliant and and beautiful um, when you when you do get to see them. That again, the colors can be different. This one is one that's kind of faded, so sometimes um, it can be. Harder to see, and just to mention, I'm 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 giving you know, giving you ID tips on these color patterns. But um, in bumblebees in general, the color patterns can um, can vary, so they're not all exactly the same, and the the shade shading can be different. Um, but uh, moving on to the next lookalike, this one is a bit more common around the, the Twin Cities. This is the half black bumblebee. 
and this one um, is is very similar, except it just it doesn't have the the rusty patch. So it has the the abdominal segments two and three. Those first two segments there are yellow, and then the rest is black. One trick with this one, a place that people can get confused, is sometimes um, so there for for bees, their their cuticle, their their outer layer is is black, and then they have the hairs growing out of that. Sometimes if the hairs are thin or the or you're looking at the, the right, you know, at just the right angle, you'll see that black kind of coming through those yellow hairs and it can look like it's darker, but it's not really. So for this one, the important thing is to really make sure you have good light hitting the abdomen so that you can see um, what is actual hair color and what might just be the, the cuticle of the bee showing through. Um, here again, the males are similar, um, but more yellow on the face. These guys tend to be a little bit smaller than a lot of our, the other bumblebees out there. So these guys will also, um, you know, once you get to know your bumblebees well, you might notice that um, that difference too. And they're a little, they're a little kind of shaggier. Their hair's a little longer. The red belted bumblebee. Um, this is um, a bee that. Um, is the, the bane of many bumblebee biologists' existence because they're super variable. So you can see these two color patterns here that could be in the same colony of bees. Um, they, some of them have black, some of them have orange, some of them um, you know, ha have a, a mix of all those different colors. The things that are consistent are that they have a lot of black hairs kind of in between so they don't have that, that thumbtack, that T shape, but in between their wings, it'll be mostly black hairs. The other thing that's consistent is that on the second abdominal segment, um, they'll be either black or red at the edges and they'll, they'll usually be yellow in the middle. Um, the main thing for just telling these apart from the rusty patch bumblebee, um, they, they don't have that um, T-shaped thumbtack shape on the thorax, and their hairs are, um, you know, they 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 don't have just that rusty patch. If they have red hairs or orange hairs, they tend to be mixed kind of um, through further down on the abdomen, and they tend to be not like a solid patch of orange. A lot of times, it's orange mixed in with with yellow and black. So here's a couple examples of that. You can see this kind of you know, mix, mix of hairs, um, mix of kind of orange and black hairs for this one and orange and yellow hairs for this one. Another one that, that can get confused, um, and this is a bee that you'll actually only see in the late summer. And this one is actually a male so um, that I'm showing you at the top. So with this species, you usually see the males more than you see the females. So this is a bumblebee that has this whole different lifestyle where they don't make nests on their own. They go in and take over the nests of other bees, other bumblebees. So they don't have workers that come out and visit the flowers. So it's usually just when, they're, when they um, are producing males, the males go out and, and get nectar at flowers. Um, but these guys, they have that kind of T-shaped on um, black spot on the thorax, but it tends to be wider. Um, and their their abdo abdominal segments they don't have the rusty patch, so they they've, they've kind of got the T-shape, but they don't have the rusty patch. And they have um, more. They have um, usually three segments that have yellow. But so here's a picture of the female down here. She um, is is very differently colored, and um, you don't you don't see them as much. So there's, um, there's one of these males hanging out on a flower. I also wanted to go over a, a couple of other species that you may run into um, just because they're very common. Um, so, so those other species are all ones that people do sometimes pretty regularly confuse with the rusty patch bumblebee. 
these are, I'm also just showing a couple of species. I mean, you can still confuse them. People can confuse, get, get very confused about all kinds of things. Um, but I wanted you to, to see these color patterns too, because you're really likely to see these bees um, in, your, in your gardens this summer. So the first is the common Eastern bumblebee, which from its, its name, it is common. Um, the key character for identifying the um, common Eastern is that the, the first abdominal segment is yellow and then the rest of them are black. So it's, it's pretty simple, it's pretty consistent. Um, the, the males are really similar. They tend to have more yellow on the face. Um, so, so sometimes um, it can look like this kind of broad scallop across the abdomen. Um, so this is just this, this first abdominal segment is yellow and the, the rest of it is black. Um, but sometimes um, it has this kind of broad scallop. Um, bees also deal with all kinds of things through the summer. This one has lost a bunch of hair um, on her thorax. So, so she, she just has a bald spot there. So that's one thing to watch out for too, is if you see a bunch of black on the bee, is it black hair or is it just um, a bald spot? So here's another um, impatience. Again, when you're taking photos of bees, um, it can be hard to see everything that's going on on the abdomen when the wings are folded up over it. Um, sometimes it, you, you, know, you can see through them okay, but that's one thing to think about when you're getting that photo and you're trying to show the abdomen to see um, if you can really see through to see the, the hairs there. The other common species I wanted to, to talk about was the two-spotted, oh, that shouldn't have the word Eastern there, <laughs> two-spotted bumblebee, um, Babas banaculatus. And this one has like that common Eastern, it has that first abdominal segment is all yellow, but then on the second segment, it has this W shape in the middle. And that shape is really just isolated to the middle. Hold on a second. The males here again are pretty similar, but they will have um, a, a more yellow hair on the on the face. And so um, here are a couple of photos showing that um, that W shape um, on the on that second abdominal segment, which again is easier to see if they have their their wings out. Um, the wings are covering it. it, can be a little hard to see. So um, to go briefly over the, the different bees that we've been talking about, um, we've got the, the rusty patched bumblebee um, with the, the black tea and the, the rusty patch. Um, this one is the one that just has that brown swoop, that kind of rusty swoop on the second segment. And, um, and then the, the rest of that um, abdomen is, is black. And that one is the brown belted. This is um, the bee that has mostly black between the wings and then um, super variable in color. A lot of times we'll have um, some orange hair there. On, um, on the, especially the, the second and third segments, that is the red belted bumblebee. This is the one you're more likely to see up north. So it's got that, that thumbtack shape like the rusty patch does, um, but the color pattern here is really distinct and the colors are really bright. So it's more um, that that whole second and third segments on the abdomen are orange um, and then and then another whole segment is yellow. That is the, the tri-colored bumblebee. So this is one where the it's similar to the rusty patch, except it doesn't have the thumbtack, doesn't have the rusty patch. That one is the half black, where it has the first two segments yellow and then the, the rest is black. This is one that, that again, has a pretty similar thumbtack, um, but doesn't have the rusty patch has three segments that are yellow, um, and that is the lemon cuckoo bumblebee. Um, 
this one is one that isn't usually confused um, with the rusty patch and just has that that first segment yellow and the rest are black that is the common eastern and then this is the one with the um, w shape on that second segment and that is the two spotted so um, i wanted to bring up this photo which was actually this is the photo that i had at the um on my title slide that um, for for rusty patch bumblebee identification. So um, on uh, you know does this does this look like a rusty patch bumblebee? I'm I'm being tricky here <laughs> just to, to give 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 it away. Um, but you don't see a T shape here. Um, you don't really see any rusty patch. So um, that is actually a rusty patch bumblebee, but it doesn't have a rusty patch or the T shape. And that's because she's a queen. And uh, for most bumblebees, the queens are colored the same as the as the workers. The workers are also female. Um, but um, the um, the rusty patch bumblebee, it's the only bumblebee we have in North America where the queen actually has a different color pattern. So. Um, so it is, um, it is, we do want to know a lot more about the, the, the queens and what they're doing. So getting information about the queens is really exciting if you can spot queens. So we can see um, you know, what they're using for, for floral sources. Um, we can see where queens are looking for nests in the spring. Um, so for, for, for these bees, the key characters for the queen, rusty patch bumblebees, um, are that they're, um, the queens are a lot bigger than the workers. So, and, um, and the rusty patch bumblebee queen um, specifically is, is kind of a, a large and robust queen. Um, she has a lot of black hairs on the top of her head. Her, um, the hairs on her thorax are kind of um, velvety. They're kind of um, shorter than, than some of the other species. And for these guys, they don't have the rusty patch. They just have yellow on those first two abdominal segments, and then the rest is black. So I do have, um, you know, if you if you want to get into it, there's a video on the B Lab YouTube channel that goes all into um, some some more details of how to tell the rusty patch bumblebee queens apart from from other similar species. Um, so I, I wanted to talk to you too about specifically about how you can um, participate and you know what to do with your photos. So so um, Daniel already mentioned the Bumblebee Watch. So um, for for people not familiar with that, they have a, a website and an app you can get on your phone, and there you're um, taking photos. Um, you can either up, upload them right through the app or when you get back home, if you want to use your computer, you can, can upload them there. Um, you do get to go through and work on identifying your species first, but then um, your, your sighting will be gone through and um, verified by an expert. Another way to share um, information about pollinators, so um, especially if you're out there and you see other pollinators besides bumblebees. Um, Bumblebee Watch is just for bumblebees, but as I mentioned at the beginning, there's lots of other exciting bees out there. And iNaturalist is another um, platform you can use. So again, an app or just online um, at iNaturalist.org. And same kind of idea where you take photos and submit them iNaturalist works a little bit differently where it's crowdsourced for the identification. There are a lot of bee experts that go in and um, kind of check on things, um, but, um, but it's not um, any, 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 anyone who feels confident in their identification can go through and um, add identifications onto things. And iNaturalist is for all living things. So also if you see flowers that you're um, not sure what they are, you can um, share them on iNaturalist and, and get some help there. A couple specific um, projects if you want to get more involved, um, the Backyard Bumblebee Count. This is going to be the third year that we're, we're doing this program. So um, um, there's, I've been collaborating with the 
Fish and Wildlife Service and um, some, some other people working on bumblebees in, in Wisconsin and other places to um, do the backyard bumblebee count. So this is all across North America. The idea with this is that it's kind of like um, the Christmas bird count, but we're timing this for when bumblebee colonies, especially rusty patch bumblebee colonies might be at their peak with the idea that if we encourage as many people as we can to get out and take pictures of bumblebees in that last kind of couple of weeks, that last week or so of July, um, that's um, the best time that we're gonna have a chance to um, get more photos of, of the rusty patch bumblebee and um, learn more about where they are, which is really important. So part of the reason the Fish and Wildlife Service is into this is that um, in making recovery plans for endangered species, they really need to know where they are. So more information we have about where they are, um, the better we can um, get those plans and have those plans working to help the species recover. Another thing um, that is coming soon is um, a, a newer project that is the Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas. So in the past, we did have a um, Minnesota Bee Atlas that was just um, all bees um, or mostly um, stem nesting bees and also bumblebees. But um, now this project, the, the, that kind of the bumblebee surveys are kind of morphing into a new project that's going to be um, launching pretty soon. So this is one where you would adopt a grid somewhere in the state of Minnesota and um, commit yourself to going and surveying bumblebees there. So there's going to be online trainings available and um, everything that you need <laughs> to get going and, and ready to do it. Um, this is, I don't have the, I'm not sharing the, the, the URL publicly. We're still working on the, the website right now, but um, I think maybe even as soon as next week, we'll be able to share it. So you'll just need to stay in touch through the, through the Bee Lab and um, keep an eye on that if you are interested in, in helping us with that project. I wanted to also mention that there are a lot of, of good resources for the Rusty Patch Bumblebee on the Fish and Wildlife Service site. So um, they, they'll have, they have an up-to-date map with the, the range from records that's um, updated every year. If, um, if you're wondering about kind of um, what's going on with being endangered, if being an endangered species, how does that affect um, you know, construction projects and things like that, um, lots of information there to, to help you find that, as well as information about um, surveying and plants that they prefer, um, all kinds of things like that. So um, I also just um, wanted to point you to the, the Bee Lab website where, um, where we have all kinds of resources about, about bees. One resource in particular is that there is a two page guide to the bumblebees of Minnesota and that link is there that z.umn.edu slash bumblebees of min and um, you'll go to the pdf there and um, for, for those of you who may have seen that guide before it's newly updated this spring with a couple new species that um, were confirmed in Minnesota just last summer so, um, so the list of Minnesota bees is growing and I had to find more room on the page, but um, I'm not gonna have room for many more. Um, I, think, I think we're getting close. I, I'm, I, think, <laughs> I think we pretty much have our, our, our um, number figured out for how many bees we have in Minnesota. We also just have um, social media to, to keep up with what's happening in the Bee Lab on, um, on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, we have, you know, new things kind of happening all the time. Um, and with that, um, I am happy to answer questions. <laughs>